Hi, and welcome to Radonc Talks, a lecture series designed for students and residents of radiation oncology. My name is Rhea. I am currently a fourth year radiation oncology resident at the University of Pittsburgh. And today we will be continuing our journey through Radonc emergencies with a discussion on SVC syndrome. Unlike our previous videos on cord compression and bone metastases, there isn't a ton to talk about when it comes to SVC syndrome, so I'm hoping to keep this episode short and sweet. Let's start by talking about the pathophysiology of SVC syndrome. So the SVC, or the superior vena cava, is obviously a very important blood vessel carrying about one-third of our body's total venous return. It drains everything from the head, arms, and upper torso. All that blood goes through the right and left brachiocephalic veins into the superior vena cava and ultimately ends up in the right atrium where it can be recycled through the lungs. Anytime we talk about SVC syndrome, we're referring to obstruction of blood flow through the SVC. This is either via extrinsic compression of the vessel or something intrinsic that's leading to proximal venous congestion. Now the good news is there is some opportunity for collaterals to develop, uh, such as azygous, mammary, vertebral, and lateral, lateral thoracic veins. Um, so that can help to relieve some of that pressure in the SVC. Um, but still, the SVC is probably the bulkiest vein um, in the top third of our body. And so you can imagine that the side effects of this can be quite noticeable. So what are these symptoms? Uh, most commonly, SVC syndrome presents with edema. This can be facial edema as well as edema within the arms. Uh, there's a term facial plethora, which refers to the redness and swelling that happens from all that blood being pooled in those facial vessels. The veins themselves over the neck and chest might appear distended and actually very prominent, um, so that could be a physical exam finding. Um, we worry very much during SVC syndrome about all that blood getting backed up and causing cerebral edema. So whenever you're evaluating these patients, you always want to ask if they have a headache, if they have blurred vision, if they're having any dizziness, because those can be indicative of that cerebral edema. And then finally, you're always going to worry about their airway. Um, so evaluate if they have dyspnea, any kind of cough, hoarseness, strider. Um, and finally, also take a good look at their vital signs um, because you want to make sure they're not tachycardic, um, that their blood pressure is robust, and things like that. So always when you evaluate these patients, do a full history and physical exam. The edema and the distended veins might be very obvious to you. Always evaluate their respiratory status if they're short of breath, their vitals if they're tachycardic or hypotensive, and finally ask if they have any symptoms concerning for cerebral edema. As radiation oncologists, we are most likely to get consulted on SVC syndrome, obviously if there is a malignancy, um, but I just want to point out that SVC syndrome can be related to other causes as well, um, and it's actually more commonly in these days due to implantable IV devices such as pacemaker leads, catheters, and so on. Um, CHF, aortic aneurysm, other things besides malignancy that can lead to SVC syndrome. Within um, cancer, however, the most commonly associated cancers are non-small cell and small cell lung cancer. Non-small cell lung cancer is more common because it is more common than small cell. However, small cell lung cancer is most likely to present with SVC syndrome just because it tends to involve the central airways and it grows very, very rapidly. Other than lung cancers, lymphoma, metastases, and things like germ cell tumor and thymoma are important to think about as well. We kind of talked a little bit about the workup already um, when we were talking about presentation, but just to reiterate, we always get a full history and physical uh, focusing on the duration and severity of symptoms, assessing the patient's respiratory status and cardiac status, as well as their neurological status. Make sure to ask if they have any prior cancer diagnosis, if they've had any prior intravascular procedures. Make sure on exam you're assessing for facial changes, again, cardiac and respiratory and neurologic status. In terms of imaging, on chest x-ray, you might see a widened mediastinum. And on CT chest without contrast is really where you might visualize tumors. 
And sometimes the collaterals end up enhancing contrast, so they might light up on that CT scan. In terms of labs, you would obtain typical BMP, CBC, and if they don't have a known cancer diagnosis, you can consider LDH, AFP, beta, HCG. Um, and then finally, obviously, if they don't have a tissue diagnosis of cancer, that needs to be obtained as well. There is a grading system for SVC syndrome or a proposed classification system, which I just wanted to share with you. It ranges from grade 0 to 5, with 0 being asymptomatic and 5 being fatal. It's really important to realize that the presentation of SVC syndrome can vary greatly in severity. So when you're evaluating these patients, pay attention to the duration of symptom development, uh, how quickly did their symptoms develop, and also pay very close attention to their respiratory, cardiac, and neurologic status because any degree of neurologic or respiratory compromise can take it from a grade 1, 2, mild, moderate SVC syndrome to grade 3, severe. And if there is significant cerebral edema, significant laryngeal edema, or hemodynamic compromise, then the condition becomes grade 4 or life-threatening. In terms of management for SVC syndrome, we're always going to start with supportive measures. So elevate the head of bed to kind of decrease the venous pressure, provide supplemental oxygen if they need it. If they have signs of cerebral edema, you can consider steroids and diuretics. If they have signs of an emergency, so if they have any signs of respiratory, neurologic, or hemodynamic compromise, the first line should be endovascular stent because this is the intervention that's really going to provide the most rapid symptom relief faster than any anti-cancer treatment. Additionally, if they have any thrombosis, you can consider anticoagulation um, as long as it's not contraindicated. So just remember that for SVC syndrome, a stent is first line if there's any signs of compromise. Now, we do have a lot of anti-cancer treatments, including chemo, radiation, and surgery, but always keep in mind, does the patient have an established diagnosis of cancer or is this something new? And if it is something new, then you really, really want to make sure it's not an emergency, and then you really want to prioritize obtaining a pathologic diagnosis. We know that initiating radiation or steroids even can obscure the histologic diagnosis, and we don't want to do that because the last thing that we want to do is initiate some kind of anti-cancer treatment and then realize that we have burned a bridge to curing the patient. So always take the time to evaluate the patient if it's not an emergency, you have more time to get that pathologic diagnosis, and then you can really think about what is the best anti-cancer treatment to initiate. It's not always radiation. Sometimes chemotherapy can work faster. For example, highly chemosensitive histologies like lymphoma or germ cell, you may want to start with chemo. If it's something like thymoma, you may consider surgery. And then obviously radiation is often used um, either in palliative or curative setting for things like small cell cancer or non-small cell lung cancer. The dose of radiation, we'll talk about that here on the next slide, but it really, again, depends on the intent of our treatment and the disease pathology. And finally, in this red box, I just want to reiterate that SVC syndrome is not always an emergency. More often than not, SVC syndrome actually develops as a prolonged process over a period of weeks, and patients have time to develop collateral vessels. So if you see that on a scan, it's a sign of a slowly growing chronic process. Again, if you are concerned about an emergency, if they have any signs of respiratory, neurologic, um, or hemodynamic compromise, then endovascular stent should be the first thing you think of to provide the most rapid symptom relief. But otherwise, you have time to establish the pathologic diagnosis and kind of wisely choose your anti-cancer intervention. There's a couple of points about um, choosing therapy that I want to mention um, in the context of two studies. So the first is a meta-analysis um, that was published in 2002, and it looked at um, two randomized and 44 non-randomized studies. But basically, they looked at patients with both small cell and non-small cell lung cancer and um, compared the relief of SVC syndrome symptoms in patients that were treated with chemotherapy versus radiation up front. And what they found is that it didn't seem to matter in both cohorts, small cell and non-small cell lung cancer patients, 
um, patients seemed to derive equivalent relief whether they were treated up front with chemotherapy or radiation. Additionally, they didn't seem to have any benefits based on which radiation fractionation schedule was used or which exact chemotherapy regimen was used. So the bottom line is that both radiation and chemotherapy seem to be kind of equivalent at relieving SVC syndrome in lung cancer patients. The next study I want to highlight is a retrospective study out of Washington University that compared patients with SVC syndrome who were treated with radiation. They found that 80% of the patients had good to excellent symptomatic relief. What they noted is that the two-week relief rates were slightly higher in patients that were treated with an initial high dose of radiation, 3 to 4 gray for three fractions, versus patients that were treated with 2 gray per fraction for the entire duration. So 70% versus 56%. Um, and the p-value was 0.09. So um, I guess from this study, what we can conclude is that if you want to, you can consider initiating treatment with a higher dose of radiation, so maybe three to four gray per fraction for the first two to three days. And then if you're going to be treating the patient with the goal of palliation, you can continue that regimen, for example, three gray times 10 for a total of 30 gray. Or if the goal is curative, then maybe you can switch to 1.8 to two gray per fraction and kind of complete the course of definitive radiation after that initial high dose per fraction for the first couple of days. So in terms of dosing, those are kind of your two options. And leading with three to four gray per fraction has the benefit of offering maybe some faster symptomatic relief and also, um, you know, allowing you to buy some time to complete staging. And then if you need to decrease the dose per fraction and go for a longer period of time, you can. Um, you know, and especially with radiosensitive histologies, it seems that radiation is very, very effective. You can see improvements within just the first 72 hours, and 60 to 70 percent of patients actually have a good, excellent response. So radiation works really well for these patients. So believe it or not, that is actually all I have for SVC syndrome. Uh, just a few points listed here uh, that I want to kind of reiterate for you. Uh, we talked about how SVC syndrome is most often caused by non-small cell lung cancer, but small cell lung cancer more commonly presents with SVC syndrome just because small cell likes to grow along central airways and it can be very rapidly progressive. We also talked about how SVC syndrome can be an emergency, but more often it actually develops over a period of weeks. Signs of an emergency would be any hemodynamic instability, respiratory or neurologic compromise. Initial management, we discuss supportive measures, and if it is truly an emergency, then you want to think about an endovascular stent. For cancer therapies, remember we always want to make sure the patient has adequate tissue diagnosis. We can think about chemotherapy if it's a highly sensitive histology such as lymphoma, small cell, or a germ cell tumor. If we're treating with radiation, it's really important to consider whether our treatment goal is palliative versus curative. And even if we're dealing with a curative case, we talked about considering a higher dose per fraction in the first few treatments, like the first two or three treatments, and then decreasing um, to kind of more conventional fractionation to finish out the definitive course of radiation. And that wraps it up. Hopefully this was helpful to you, and thank you so much for listening.